Section 13 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Life of Abraham Lincoln by Ward Hill Lamon. Chapter 10, Part 2. It was at this session of the legislature, March 3, 1837, that Mr. Lincoln began that anti-slavery record upon which his fame through all time must chiefly rest. It was a very mild beginning, but even that required uncommon courage and candor in the day and generation in which it was done. The whole country was excited concerning the doctrines and the practices of the abolitionists. These agitators were as yet but few in numbers, but in New England they comprised some of the best citizens, and their leaders were persons of high character, of culture and social influence, while in the Middle States they were for the most part confined to the Society of Friends or Quakers. All were earnest, active, and uncompromising in the propagation of their opinions, and believing slavery to be the sum of all villainies, with the utmost pertinacity they claimed the unrestricted right to disseminate their convictions in any manner they saw fit, regardless of all consequences. They paid not the slightest heed to the wishes or the opinions of their opponents. They denounced all compromises with an unsparing tongue, and would allow no law of man to stand in their eyes above the law of God. George Thompson, identified with emancipation in the British West Indies, had come and gone. For more than a year he had addressed public meetings in New England, the Central States, and Ohio, and contributed not a little to the growing excitement by his fierce denunciations of the slaveholding class, in language with which his long agitation in England had made him familiar. He was denounced, insulted, and mobbed, and even in Boston he was once posted as an infamous foreign scoundrel, and an offer was made of a hundred dollars to snake him out of a public meeting. In fact, Boston was not at all behind other cities and towns in its condemnation of the abolitionists. A great meeting in Faneuil Hall, called by eighteen hundred leading citizens, Whigs and Democrats, condemned their proceedings in language as strong and significant as Richard Fletcher, Peleg Sprague, and Harrison Gray Otis could write it. But Garrison still continued to publish The Liberator, filling it with all the uncompromising aggressiveness of his sect, and distributing it throughout the southern states. It excited great alarm in the slaveholding communities, where its secret circulation, in the minds of the slaveholders, tended to incite the slaves to insurrections, assassinations, and running away but in the place where it was published it was looked upon with general contempt and disgust. When the mayor of Baltimore wrote to the mayor of Boston to have it suppressed, the latter, the eloquent Otis, replied that his officers had ferreted out the paper and its editor, whose office was an obscure hole, his only visible auxiliary a negro boy, his supporters a few insignificant persons of all colors. At the close of the year 1835, President Jackson had called the attention of Congress to the doings of these people, in language corresponding to the natural wrath with which he viewed the character of their proceedings. I must also, said he, invite your attention to the painful excitements in the South by attempts to circulate through the mails inflammatory appeals addressed to the passions of slaves in prints and various sorts of publications calculated to stimulate them to insurrection and to produce all the horrors of civil war it is fortunate for the country that the good sense the generous feeling and the deep-rooted attachment of the people of the non-slaveholding states to the union and their fellow-citizens of the same blood in the south have given so strong and impressive a tone to the sentiments entertained against the proceedings of the misguided persons who have engaged in these unconstitutional and wicked attempts, and especially against the emissaries from foreign parts who have dared to interfere in this matter, as to authorize the hope that these attempts will no longer be persisted in. 
I would therefore call the special attention of Congress to the subject, and respectfully suggest the propriety of passing such a law as will prohibit, under severe penalties, the circulation in the southern states, through the mail, of incendiary publications intended to instigate the slaves to insurrection. Mr. Clay said the sole purpose of the abolitionists was to array one portion of the Union against the other. With that in view, in all their leading prints and publications, the alleged horrors of slavery are depicted in the most glowing and exaggerated colors, to excite the imaginations and stimulate the rage of the people of the free states against the people of the slaveholding states. Why are the slave states wantonly and cruelly assailed? Why does the abolition press teem with publications tending to excite hatred and animosity on the part of the free states against the slave states? Why is Congress petitioned? Is their purpose to appeal to our understanding and actuate our humanity? And do they expect to accomplish that purpose by holding us up to the scorn and contempt and detestation of the people of the free states and the whole civilized world? Union on the one side will beget union on the other. One section will stand in menacing hostile array against another. The collision of opinion will be quickly followed by the clash of arms. Mr. Everett, then, in 1836, Governor of Massachusetts, informed the legislature, for the admonition of these unsparing agitators against the peace of the South, that everything that tends to disturb the relations created by this compact, the Constitution, is at war with its spirit, and whatever, by direct and necessary operation, is calculated to excite an insurrection among the slaves, has been held by highly respectable legal authority as an offence against the peace of this commonwealth, which may be prosecuted as a misdemeanor at common law. It was proposed in the legislature to pass an act defining the offence with more certainty, and attaching to it a severer penalty. The abolitionists asked to be heard before the committee, and Rev. S. J. May, Ellis Gray Loring, Prof. Charles Fallen, Samuel E. Sewell, and others of equal ability and character, spoke in their behalf. They objected to the passage of such an act in the strongest terms, and derided the value of a union which could not protect its citizens in one of their most cherished rights. During the hearing, several bitter altercations took place between them and the chairman. In New York, Governor Marcy called upon the legislature, to do what may be done consistently with the great principles of civil liberty, to put an end to the evils which the abolitionists are bringing upon us and the whole country. The character and the interests of the state were equally at stake, and both would be sacrificed unless these furious and cruel fanatics were effectually suppressed. In May 1836 the Federal House of Representatives resolved by overwhelming votes that Congress had no right to interfere with slavery in the States or in the District of Columbia, and that henceforth all abolition petitions should be laid on the table, without being printed or referred. And one day later than the date of Mr. Lincoln's protest, Mr. Van Buren declared in his inaugural that no bill abolishing slavery in the District of Columbia, or meddling with it in the States where it existed, should ever receive his signature. There was no other form, says Benton, at that time, in which slavery agitation could manifest itself, or a place it could find a point to operate. The Ordinance of 1787 and the Compromise of 1820, having closed up the territories against it, danger to slave property in the States, either by direct action or indirectly through the District of Columbia, were the only points of expressed apprehension. Abolition agitations fared little better in the 25th Congress than in the 24th. At the extra session in September of 1837, Mr. Slade of Vermont introduced two petitions for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, but after a furious debate and a stormy scene, they were disposed of by the adoption of the following. Resolved, that all petitions, memorials, and papers, touching the abolition of slavery, 
or the buying selling or transferring of slaves in any state district or territory of the united states be laid on the table without being debated printed read or referred and that no further action whatever shall be had thereon in illinois at the time we speak of march eighteen thirty seven an abolitionist was rarely seen and scarcely ever heard of in many parts of the state such a person would have been treated as a criminal it is true there were a few covenanters with whom hatred of slavery in any form and wherever found was an essential part of their religion up to eighteen twenty four they had steadily refused to vote or in any other way to acknowledge the state government regarding it as a heathen and unbaptized institution because the constitution failed to recognize jesus christ as the head of the government and the holy scriptures as the only rule of faith and practice it was only when it was proposed to introduce slavery into illinois by an alteration of that heathen constitution that the covenanters consented to take part in public affairs the movement which drew them out proved to be a long and unusually bitter campaign lasting full eighteen months and ending in the fall of eighteen twenty four with a popular majority of several thousand against calling a convention for the purpose of making illinois a slave state many of the anti-slavery leaders in this contest conspicuous among whom was governor coles were gentlemen from slave states who had emancipated their slaves before removal and were opposed to slavery not upon religious or moral grounds but because they believed it would be a material injury to the new country practically no other view of the question was discussed and a person who should have undertaken to discuss it from the man and brother standpoint of more modern times would have been set down as a lunatic a clear majority of the people were against the introduction of slavery into their own state but that majority were fully agreed with their brethren of the minority that those who went about to interfere with slavery in the most distant manner in places where it already existed were deserving of the severest punishment as the common enemies of society it was in those days a mortal offence to call a man an abolitionist for abolitionist was synonymous with thief between a band of men who stole horses and a band of men who stole negroes the popular mind made small distinctions in the degrees of guilt they were regarded as robbers disturbers of the peace the instigators of arson murder poisoning rape and in addition to all this traitors to the government under which they lived and enemies to the union which gave us as a people liberty and strength in testimony of these sentiments illinois enacted a black code of most preposterous and cruel severity a code that would have been a disgrace to a slave state and was simply an infamy in a free one it borrowed the provisions of the most revolting laws known among men for exiling selling beating bedeviling and torturing negroes whether bond or free under this law governor coles the leader of the anti-slavery party who had emancipated his slaves and settled them around him in his new home but had neglected to file a bond with the condition that his freedmen should behave well and never become a charge upon the public was fined two hundred dollars in each case and so late as eighteen fifty two the writer of these pages very narrowly escaped the same penalty for the same offence in eighteen thirty five thirty six reverend elijah p lovejoy had been publishing a moderately anti-slavery paper at st louis but the people of that city did not look with favour upon his enterprise and after meeting with considerable opposition in the summer of eighteen thirty six he moved his types and press across the river to alton illinois here he found an opposition more violent than that from which he had fled his press was thrown into the river the night after its arrival and he was informed that no abolition paper would be allowed in the town the better class of citizens however deprecated the outrage and pledged themselves to reimburse mr lovejoy in case he would agree not to make his paper an abolition journal. In 
Mr. Lovejoy assured them it was not his purpose to establish such a paper in Alton, but one of a religious character. At the same time, he would not give up his right as an American citizen to publish whatever he pleased on any subject, holding himself answerable to the laws of his country in so doing. With this general understanding he was permitted to go forward. He continued about a year, discussing in his paper the slavery question occasionally, not, however, in a violent manner, but with a tone of moderation. This policy, however, was not satisfactory. It was regarded as a violation of his pledge, and the contents of his office were again destroyed. Mr. Lovejoy issued an appeal for aid to re-establish his paper, which met with a prompt and generous response. He proposed to bring up another press, and announced that armed men would protect it. Meantime a committee presented him with some resolutions, adopted at a large meeting of the citizens of Alton, reminding him that he had previously given a pledge that in his paper he would refrain from advocating abolitionism, and also censuring him for not having kept his promise, and desiring to know if he intended to continue the publication of such doctrines in the future. His response consisted of a denial of the right of any portion of the people of Alton to prescribe what questions he should or should not discuss in his paper. Great excitement followed. Another press was brought up on the 21st of December, which shortly after followed the fate of its predecessors, Another arrived November 7, 1837, and was conveyed to a stone warehouse by the riverside, where Mr. Lovejoy and a few friends, some of them not abolitionists, resolved to defend it to the last. That night they were attacked. First there was a brief parley, then a volley of stones, then an attempt to carry the building by assault. At this juncture a shot was fired out of a second-story window, which killed a young man in the crowd. It was said to have been fired by Lovejoy, and as the corpse was borne away, the wrath of the populace knew no bounds. It was proposed to get powder from the magazine and blow the warehouse up. Others thought the torch would be a better agent, and finally a man ran up a ladder to fire the roof. Lovejoy came out of the door, and firing one shot, retreated within, where he rallied the garrison for a sortie, in the meantime many shots were fired, both by the assailants and the assailed. The house was once actually set on fire by one person from the mob, and saved by another. But the courage of Mr. Lovejoy's friends was gradually sinking, and they responded but faintly to his strong appeals for action. As a last resource he rushed to the door with a single companion, gun in hand, and was shot dead on the threshold. The other man was wounded in the leg, the warehouse was in flames, the mob grew more ferocious over the blood that had been shed, and riddled the doors and windows with volleys from all sorts of firearms. The abolitionists had fought a good fight, but seeing now nothing but death before them, in that dismal, bloody, and burning house, they escaped down the river bank by twos and threes as best they could, and their press was tumbled after them into the river and thus ended the first attempt to establish an abolition paper in Illinois. The result was certainly anything but encouraging, and indicated pretty clearly what must have been the general state of public feeling throughout the state in regard to slavery agitation. In fact, no state was more alive to the necessity of repressing the abolitionists than Illinois, and, accordingly, it was proposed in the legislature to take some action similar to that which had been already taken, or was actually pending, in the legislatures of sister commonwealths, from Massachusetts through the list. A number of resolutions were reported, and passed with no serious opposition. The record does not disclose the precise form in which they passed, but that is of little consequence now that they were extreme enough may be gathered from the considerate language of the protest, and from the fact that such a protest was considered necessary at all. The protest was undoubtedly the product of Mr. Lincoln's pen, for his adroit directness is seen in every word of it. He could get but one man, his colleague Dan Stone, to sign with him. 
March 3, 1837. The following protest was presented to the House, which was read and ordered to be spread on the journals, to wit. Resolutions upon the subject of domestic slavery having passed both branches of the General Assembly at its present session, the undersigned hereby protest against the passage of the same. They believe that the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy, but that the promulgation of abolition doctrines tends rather to increase than abate its evils. They believe that the Congress of the United States has no power under the Constitution to interfere with the institution of slavery in the different states. They believe that the Congress of the United States has the power, under the Constitution, to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, but that the power ought not to be exercised unless at the request of the people of that district. The difference between these opinions and those contained in the said resolutions is their reason for entering this protest. Signed, Dan Stone, A. Lincoln, representatives from the County of Sangamon. Mr. Lincoln says nothing here about slavery in the territories. The Missouri Compromise being in full force, and regarded as sacred by all parties, it was one of its chief effects that both sections were deprived of any pretext for the agitation of that question, from which every statesman, Federalist or Republican, Whig or Democratic, apprehended certain disaster to the Union. Neither would Mr. Lincoln suffer himself to be classed with the few despised Quakers, Covenanters, or Puritans, who were so frequently disturbing the peace of the country by abolition memorials to Congress and other public bodies. Slavery, says the protest, is wrong in principle, besides being bad in economy, but the promulgation of abolition doctrines is still worse. In the states which choose to have it, it enjoys a constitutional immunity, beyond the reach of any higher law and Congress must not touch it otherwise than to shield and protect it. Even in the District of Columbia, Mr. Lincoln and Dan Stone would leave it entirely to the will of the people. In fact, the whole paper, plain and simple as it is, seems to have been drawn with no object but to avoid the imputation of extreme views on either side. And from that day to the day of his inauguration, Mr. Lincoln never saw the time when he would have altered a word of it. He never sided with the Lovejoys. In his eyes, their work tended rather to increase than to abate the evils of slavery, and was therefore unjust as well as futile. Years afterwards, he was the steady, though quiet, opponent of Owen Lovejoy, and declared that Lovejoy's nomination for Congress over Leonard Sweat almost turned him blind. When, in 1860, the Democrats called Mr. Lincoln an abolitionist, and cited the protest of 1837 to support the charge, friends pointed to the exact language of the document as his complete and overwhelming refutation. On the 10th of May, the New York banks suspended specie payments, and two days afterwards the Bank of the United States and the Philadelphia banks did likewise. From these, the stoppage and the general ruin among businessmen and speculators alike spread throughout the country. Nevertheless, the fund commissioners of Illinois succeeded in placing a loan during the summer, and before the end of the year work had begun on many railroads. Money was as plenty as dirt. Industry, in place of being stimulated, actually languished. We exported nothing, and everything was paid for by the borrowed money expended among us. And this money was bank paper, such as a pensioner upon the government of the United States scorned to take in payment of his gratuity, after the deposit banks had suspended or broken, with thirty-two millions of government money in their possession. The banks which had received such generous legislation from the legislature that devised the internal improvement system were not disposed to see that batch of remarkable enterprises languish for want of their support. One of them took at par and sold nine hundred thousand dollars of bonds, while the other took one million seven hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars, which it used as capital, 
and expended its business accordingly but the banks were themselves in greater danger than the internal improvement system if the state bank refused specie payments for sixty days its charter was forfeited under the act of the assembly but they were the mainstay of all the current speculations public and private and having besides large sums of public money in their hands the governor was induced to call a special session of the legislature in july eighteen thirty seven to save them from impending dissolution this was done by an act authorizing or condoning the suspension of specie payments the governor had not directly recommended this but he had most earnestly recommended the repeal or modification of the internal improvement system and that the legislature positively refused this wise body might be eaten by its own dogs but it was determined not to eat them and in this direction there was no prospect of relief for two years more according to governor ford the cool reflecting men of the state anxiously hoped that their rulers might be able to borrow no more money but in this they were immediately and bitterly disappointed the united states bank took some of their bonds some were sold at par in this country and others at nine per cent discount in europe in eighteen thirty eight a governor carlin was elected who was thought by many to be secretly hostile to the system and a new legislature was chosen from which it was thought something might be hoped mr lincoln was again elected with a reputation so much enhanced by his activity and address in the last legislature that this time he was the candidate of his party for speaker the nomination however was a barren honor and known to be such when given colonel ewing was chosen by a plurality of one two whigs and two democrats scattering their votes mr lincoln kept his old place on the finance committee at the first session the governor held his peace regarding the system and far from repealing it the legislature added a new feature to it and voted another eight hundred thousand dollars but the fund commissioners were in deep water and muddy water they had reached the end of their string the credit of the state was gone and already were heard rumors of repudiation bond county had in the beginning pronounced the system a swindle upon the people and bond county began to have admirers some of the bonds had been lent to new york state banks to start upon and the banks had presently failed some had been sold on credit some were scattered about in various places on special deposit others had been sent to london for sale where the firm that was selling them broke with the proceeds of a part of them in their hands no expedients sufficed any longer there was no more money to be got and nothing left to do but to wind up the system and begin the work of common sense by providing for the interest on the sums already expended a special session of the legislature in eighteen thirty eight thirty nine did the winding up and thenceforth for some years there was no other question so important in the illinois state politics as how to pay the interest on the vast debt outstanding for this account many gentlemen discovered that dewitt clintons were rare and in certain contingencies very precious among these must have been mr lincoln but being again elected to the legislature in eighteen forty again the acknowledged leader and candidate of his party for speaker he ventured in december of that year to offer an expedient for paying the interest on the debt but it was only an expedient and a very poor one to avoid the obvious but unpopular resort of direct taxation mr lincoln moved to strike out the bill and amendment and insert the following an act providing for the payment of interest on the state debt section one be it enacted by the people of the state of illinois represented in the general assembly that the governor be authorized and required to issue from time to time such an amount of state bonds to be called the illinois interest bonds as may be absolutely necessary for the payment of the interest upon the lawful debt of the state contracted before the passage of this act section two said bonds shall bear interest at the rate of blank per cent per annum payable half yearly at blank 
and be reimbursable in blank years from their respective issuings. Section 3 that the state's portion of the tax hereafter arising from all lands which were not taxable in the year one thousand eight hundred and forty is hereby set apart as an exclusive fund for the payment of interest on the said illinois interest bonds and the faith of the state is hereby pledged that said fund shall be applied to that object and no other except at any time there should be a surplus in which case such surplus shall become a part of the general funds of the treasury section four that hereafter the sum of thirty cents for each hundred dollars worth of all taxable property shall be paid into the state treasury and no more than forty cents for each hundred dollars worth of such taxable property shall be levied and collected for county purposes it was a loose document the governor was to determine the amount of bonds necessary and the sums for which they should be issued interest was to be paid only upon the lawful debt and the governor was left to determine what part of it was lawful and what unlawful the last section lays a specific tax but the proceeds are in no way connected with the interest bonds mr lincoln said he submitted this proposition with great diffidence he had felt his share of the responsibility devolving upon us in the present crisis and after revolving in his mind every scheme which seemed to afford the least prospect of relief he submitted this as the result of his own deliberations the details of the bill might be imperfect but he relied upon the correctness of its general features by the plan proposed in the original bill of hypothecating our bonds he was satisfied we could not get along more than two or three months before some other step would be necessary another session would have to be called and new provisions made it might be objected that these bonds would not be saleable and the money could not be raised in time he was no financier but he believed these bonds thus secured would be equal to the best in the market a perfect security was provided for the interest and it was this characteristic that inspired confidence and made bonds saleable if there was any distrust it could not be because our means of fulfilling promises were to be distrusted he believed it would have the effect to raise our other bonds in the market there was another objection to this plan which applied to the original bill and that was as to the impropriety of borrowing money to pay interest on borrowed money that we are hereby paying compound interest to this he would reply that if it were a fact that our population and wealth were increasing in a ratio greater than the increased interest hereby incurred then this was not a good objection if our increasing means would justify us in deferring to a future time the resort to taxation then we had better pay compound interest than resort to taxation now he was satisfied that by a direct tax now money enough could not be collected to pay the accruing interest the bill proposed to provide in this way for interest not otherwise provided for it was not intended to apply to those bonds for the interest on which a security had already been provided he hoped the house would seriously consider the proposition he had no pride in its success as a measure of his own but submitted it to the wisdom of the house with the hope that if there was anything objectionable in it it would be pointed out and amended mr lincoln's measure did not pass there was a large party in favor not only of passing the interest on the state debt which fell due in the coming january and july but of repudiating the whole debt outright others thought the state ought to pay not the full face of its bonds but only the amount received for them while others still contended that whereas many of the bonds had been irregularly illegally and even fraudulently disposed of there ought to be a particular discrimination made against these and these only at last mr caverly a member from green introduced a bill of two sections authorizing the fund commissioners to hypothecate internal improvement bonds to the amount of three hundred thousand dollars 
and which contained the remarkable provision that the proceeds were to be applied by that officer to the payment of all interest legally due on the public debt thus shifting from the general assembly and devolving on the fund commissioner the duty of deciding the legality of the debt thus by this happy expedient conflicting opinions were reconciled without direct action on the matter in controversy and thus the two houses were enabled to agree upon a measure to provide temporarily for the interest on the public debt the legislature further provided at this session for the issue of interest bonds to be sold in the market at what they would bring and an additional tax of ten cents on the hundred dollars worth of property was imposed and pledged to pay the interest on these bonds by these contrivances the interest for january and july eighteen forty one was paid the fund commissioner hypothecated internal improvement bonds for the money first due and his successor in office finding no sale for illinois stocks so much had the credit of the state fallen was compelled to hypothecate eight hundred and four thousand dollars of interest bonds for the july interest on this hypothecation he was to have received three hundred and twenty one thousand six hundred dollars but was never paid more than two hundred and sixty one thousand five hundred dollars these bonds have never been redeemed from the holders though eighty of them were afterwards repurchased and three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars of them were received from the shawneetown bank for state stock in that institution note ford's history of illinois End note. this session the session of eighteen forty forty one had been called two weeks earlier than usual to provide for the january interest on the debt but the banks had important business of their own in view and proceeded to improve the occasion in eighteen thirty seven and every year since then the banks had succeeded in getting acts of the legislature which condoned their suspension of specie payments but by the terms of the last act their charters were forfeited unless they resumed before the adjournment of the next session the democrats however maintained that the present special session was a session in the sense of the law and that before its adjournment the banks must hand out the hard or die on the other hand the whigs held that this session and the regular session which began on the first monday in december to be one and the same and proposed to give the banks another winter's lease upon life and rags but the banks were a power in the land and knew how to make themselves felt they were the depositories of the state revenues the auditors warrants were drawn upon them and the members of the legislature paid in their money the auditors warrants were drawn upon them and the members of the legislature paid in their money the warrants were at a discount of fifty per cent and if the banks refused to cash them the members would be compelled to go home more impecunious than they came the banks moreover knew how to make opportune loans to democrats and with all these aids they organized a brilliant and eventually a successful campaign in the eyes of the whigs they were the institutions of the country and the democrats were guilty of incivism in attacking them but the democrats retorted with a string of overwhelming slang about rag barons rags printed lies bank vassals ragocracy and the british bought bank blue light federal whig party it was a fierce and bitter contest and witnessing it one might have supposed that the very existence of the state with the right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness depended upon the result the democrats were bent upon carrying an adjournment sine die which according to their theory killed the banks to defeat this the whigs resorted to every expedient of parliamentary tactics and at length hit upon one entirely unknown to any of the standard manuals they tried to absent themselves in sufficient numbers to leave no quorum behind if the whigs absented themselves says mr gillespie a whig member there would not be a quorum left even with the two who should be deputed to call the eyes and nose the whigs immediately held a meeting and resolved that they would all stay out 
except Lincoln and me, who were to call the eyes and nose. We appeared in the afternoon. Motion to adjourn sine die was made, and we called the eyes and nose. The Democrats discovered the game, and the sergeant-at-arms was sent out to gather up the absentees. There was great excitement in the house, which was then held in a church at Springfield. We soon discovered that several Whigs had been caught and brought in, and that the plan had been spoiled, and we, Lincoln and I, determined to leave the hall, and going to the door found it locked, and then raised a window and jumped out, but not until the Democrats had succeeded in adjourning. Mr. Gridley of McLean accompanied us in our exit. I think Mr. Lincoln always regretted that he entered into that arrangement, as he deprecated everything that savored of the revolutionary. In the course of the debate on the apportionment bill, Mr. Lincoln had occasion to address the House in defense of the Long Nine, who were especially obnoxious to the Democrats. The speech concluded with the following characteristic passage. The gentleman had accused old women of being partial to the number nine, but this, he presumed, was without foundation. A few years since, it would be recollected by the House, that the delegation from this county were dubbed by way of eminence the Long Nine, and by way of further distinction he had been called the longest of the nine. Now, said Mr. Lincoln, I desire to say to my friend from Monroe, Mr. Bissell, that if any woman, old or young, ever thought there was any peculiar charm in this distinguished specimen of number nine, I have as yet been so unfortunate as not to have discovered it. Loud applause. But this legislature was full of excitements. Besides the questions about the public debt and the bank charters, the Democrats proposed to legislate the circuit judges out of office, and reconstruct the Supreme Court to suit themselves. They did this because the Supreme Judges had already decided one question of some political interest against them, and were now about to decide another in the same way. The latter was a question of great importance, and in order to avoid the consequences of such a decision, the Democrats were eager for the extremist measures. The Constitution provided that all free white male inhabitants should vote upon six months' residence. This, the Democrats held, included aliens, while the Whigs held the reverse. On this grave judicial question, parties were divided precisely upon the line of their respective interests. The aliens numbered about ten thousand, and nine-tenths of them voted steadily with the democracy. Whilst a great outcry concerning it was being made from both sides, and fierce disputes raged in the newspapers and on the stump, two Whigs at Galena got up an amicable case to try it in a quiet way before a Whig judge, who held the circuit courts in their neighborhood. The judge decided for his friends, like a man that he was. The Democrats found it out, and raised a popular tumult about it that would have put Demetrius the silversmith to shame. They carried the case to the Supreme Court, where it was argued before the Whig majority in December 1889 by able and distinguished counselors, Judge Douglas being one of them, but the only result was a continuance to next June. In the meantime, Judge Smith, the only Democrat on the bench, was seeking favor with his party friends by betraying to Douglas the secrets of the consultation room. With his aid, the Democrats found a defect in the record, which sent the case over to December 1840, and adroitly secured the alien vote for the great elections of that memorable year. The legislature elected, then, was overwhelmingly democratic, and having good reason to believe that the aliens had small favor to expect from this court, they determined forthwith to make a new one that would be more reasonable. There were now nine circuit judges in the state, and four supreme judges, under the Act of 1835. The offices of the circuit judges the Democrats concluded to abolish, and to create instead nine supreme judges who should perform circuit duties. This they called reforming the judiciary, and thirsting for vengeance, as Governor Ford says, they went about the work with all the zeal, but with very little of the disinterested devotion, which reformers are generally supposed to have. 
Douglas, counsel for one of the litigants, made a furious speech in the lobby, demanding the destruction of the court that was to try his cause, and for sundry grave sins which he imputed to the judges, he gave Smith, his friend Smith, as authority. It was useless to oppose it. This reform was a foregone conclusion. It was called the Douglas Bill, and Mr. Douglas was appointed to one of the new offices created by it. But Mr. Lincoln, E. D. Baker, and other Whig members entered upon the journal the following protest. For the reasons thus presented, and for others no less apparent, the undersigned cannot assent to the passage of the bill, or permit it to become a law, without this evidence of their disapprobation, and they now protest against the reorganization of the judiciary, because, first, it violates the great principles of free government by subjecting the judiciary to the legislature, second, it is a fatal blow at the independence of the judges and the constitutional term of their offices, third, it is a measure not asked for or wished for by the people, fourth, it will greatly increase the expense of our courts, or else greatly diminish their utility. Fifth, it will give our courts a political and partisan character, thereby impairing public confidence in their decisions. Sixth, it will impair our standing with other states and the world. Seventh, it is a party measure for party purposes, from which no practical good to the people can possibly arise but which may be the source of immeasurable evils. The undersigned are well aware that this protest will be altogether unavailing with the majority of this body. The blow has already fallen, and we are compelled to stand by, the mournful spectators of the ruin it will cause. Mr. Lincoln was elected in 1840, to serve, of course, until the next election in August 1842, but for reasons of a private nature, to be explained hereafter, he did not appear during the session of 1841-42. In concluding this chapter, taking leave of New Salem, Vandalia, and the legislature, we cannot forbear another quotation from Mr. Wilson, Lincoln's colleague from Sangamon, to whom we are already so largely in debt. In 1838, many of the Long Nines were candidates for re-election to the legislature. A question of the division of the county was one of the local issues. Mr. Lincoln and myself, among others, residing in the portion of the county sought to be organized into a new county, and opposing the division, it became necessary that I should make a special canvass through the northwest part of the county, then known as Sand Ridge. I made the canvass, Mr. Lincoln accompanied me, and being personally well acquainted with every one, we called at nearly every house. At that time it was the universal custom to keep some whiskey in the house for private use and to treat friends. The subject was always mentioned as a matter of etiquette, but with the remark to Mr. Lincoln, you never drink, but maybe your friend would like to take a little. I never saw Mr. Lincoln drink. He often told me he never drank, had no desire for drink, nor for the companionship of drinking men. Candidates never treated anybody in those times unless they wanted to do so. Mr. Lincoln remained in New Salem until the spring of 1837, when he went to Springfield, and went into the law office of John T. Stewart, as a partner in the practice of law, and boarded with William Butler. During his stay in New Salem, he had no property other than what was necessary to do his business, until after he stopped in Springfield. He was not avaricious to accumulate property, never was a spendthrift. He was almost always during those times hard up. He never owned land. The first trip he made around the circuit, after he commenced the practice of law, I had a horse, saddle, and bridle, and he had none. I let him have mine. I think he must have been careless, as the saddle skinned the horse's back. While he lived in New Salem he visited me often. He would stay a day or two at a time. We generally spent the time at the stores in Athens. He was very fond of company. Telling or hearing stories told was a source of great amusement to him. He was not in the habit of reading much, never read novels. Whittling pine boards and shingles, 
talking and laughing, constituted the entertainment of the days and evenings. In a conversation with him about that time, he told me that although he appeared to enjoy life rapturously, still he was the victim of terrible melancholy. He sought company, and indulged in fun and hilarity without restraint or stint as to time. But when by himself he told me that he was so overcome by mental depression that he never dared carry a knife in his pocket, and as long as I was intimately acquainted with him, previous to his commencement of the practice of law, he never carried a pocket-knife. Still he was not misanthropic, he was kind and tender-hearted in his treatment to others. In the summer of 1837 the citizens of Athens and vicinity gave the delegation then called the Long Nine a public dinner, at which Mr. Lincoln and all the others were present. He was called out by the toast, Abraham Lincoln, one of nature's noblemen, I have often thought that if any man was entitled to that compliment, it was he. End of section 13。section 14 of the life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Life of Abraham Lincoln by Ward Hill Lemon. Chapter 11. Part 1. Under the Act of Assembly, due in great part to Mr. Lincoln's exertions, the removal of the archives and other public property of the State from Vandalia to Springfield, began on the fourth day of july eighteen thirty nine and was speedily completed at the time of the passage of the act in the winter of eighteen thirty six thirty seven mr lincoln determined to follow the capital and establish his own residence at springfield the resolution was natural and necessary for he had been studying law in all his intervals of leisure and wanted a wider field than the justice's court at New Salem to begin his practice. Henceforth Mr. Lincoln might serve in the legislature, attend to his private business, and live snugly at home. In addition to the state courts, the circuit and district courts of the United States sat here. The eminent John McLean of Ohio was the justice of the Supreme Court who sat in this circuit, with Judge Pope of the district court, from 1839 to 1849, and after that with Judge Drummond. The first terms of these courts, and the first session of the legislature at Springfield, were held in December 1839. The Senate sat in one church and the House in another. Mr. Lincoln got his license as an attorney early in 1837, and commenced practice regularly as a lawyer in the town of Springfield, in March of that year. His first case was that of Hawthorne v. Wooldridge, dismissed at the cost of the plaintiff, for whom Mr. Lincoln's name was entered. There were then on the list of attorneys at the Springfield Bar many names of subsequent renown. Judge Stephen T. Logan was on the bench of the Circuit Court under the Act of 1835, Stephen A. Douglas had made his appearance as the public prosecutor at the March term of 1836, and at the same term E. D. Baker had been admitted to the practice. Among the rest were John T. Stewart, Cyrus Walker, S. H. Treat, Jesse B. Thomas, George Forquer, Dan Stone, Ninian W. Edwards, John J. Hardin, Schuyler Strong, A. T. Bledsoe, and Josiah Lamborn. By this time Mr. Lincoln enjoyed considerable local fame as a politician, but none, of course, as a lawyer. He therefore needed a partner, and got one in the person of John T. Stewart, an able and distinguished Whig, who had relieved his poverty years before by the timely loan of books with which to study law, and who had from the first promoted his political fortunes with zeal as disinterested as it was effective. The connection promised well for Mr. Lincoln, and no doubt did well during the short period of its existence. The courtroom was in Hoffman's Row, 
and the office of Stuart and Lincoln was in the second story above the courtroom. It was a little room, and generally a dirty one. It contained a small dirty bed, on which Lincoln lounged and slept, a buffalo robe, a chair, and a bench. Here the junior partner, when disengaged from the cares of politics and the legislature, was to be found pretty much all the time, reading, abstracted, and gloomy. Springfield was a small village, containing between one and two thousand inhabitants. There were no pavements. The street crossings were made of chunks, stones, and sticks. Lincoln boarded with Honorable William Butler, a gentleman who possessed, in an eminent degree, that mysterious power which guides the deliberations of party conventions and legislative bodies to a foregone conclusion. Lincoln was very poor, worth nothing, and in debt, circumstances which are not often alleged in behalf of the modern legislator. But Bill Butler was his friend, and took him in with little reference to board bills and the settlement of accounts. According to Dr. Jane, he fed and clothed him for years, and this signal service, rendered at a very critical time, Mr. Lincoln forgot wholly when he was in Congress, and Butler wanted to be Register of the Land Office, as well as when he was President of the United States, and opportunities of repayment were multitudinous. It is doubtless all true, but the inference of personal ingratitude on the part of Mr. Lincoln will not bear examination. It will be shown at another place that Mr. Lincoln regarded all public offices within his gift as a sacred trust, to be administered solely for the people, and as in no sense a fund upon which he could draw for the payment of private accounts. He never preferred his friends to his enemies, but rather the reverse, as if fearful that he might by bare possibility be influenced by some unworthy motive. He was singularly cautious to avoid the imputation of fidelity to his friends at the expense of his opponents. In Coke's and Blackstone's time the law was supposed to be a jealous mistress, but in Lincoln's time, and at Springfield, she was anything but exacting. Politicians courted her only to make her favor the stepping-stone to success in other employments. Various members of the bar have left great reputations to posterity, but none of them were earned solely by the legitimate practice of the law. Douglas is remembered as a statesman, Baker as a political orator, Hardin as a soldier, and some now living, like Logan and Stuart, although eminent in the law, will be no less known to the history of the times as politicians than as lawyers. Among those who went to the law for a living, and to the people for fame and power, was Mr. Lincoln. He was still a member of the legislature when he settled at Springfield, and would probably have continued to run for a seat in that body as often as his time expired, but for the unfortunate results of the internal improvement system, the hopeless condition of the state finances, and a certain gloominess of mind which arose from private misfortunes that befell him about the time of his retirement. We do not say positively that these were the reasons why Mr. Lincoln made no effort to be re-elected to the legislature of 1840, but a careful study of all the circumstances will lead any reasonable man to believe that they were. He was intensely ambitious, longed ardently for place and distinction, and never gave up a prospect which seemed to him good when he was in a condition to pursue it with honor to himself and fairness to others. Moreover, state politics were then rapidly ceasing to be the high road to fame and fortune. Although the state of Illinois was insolvent, unable to pay the interest on her public debt, and many were talking about repudiating the principal, the great campaign of 1840 went off upon national issues, and little or nothing was said about questions of state policy. Mr. Lincoln felt and obeyed this tendency of the public mind, and from 1837 onward his speeches, those that were printed and those that were not, were devoted chiefly, if not exclusively, to federal affairs. In January 1837 he delivered a lecture before the Springfield Lyceum on the subject of the perpetuation of our free institutions. As a mere declamation it is unsurpassed in the annals of the West. Although delivered in midwinter, it is instinct with the peculiar eloquence of the most fervid Fourth of July. 
in the great journal of things began the orator happening under the sun we the american people find our account running under date of the nineteenth century of the christian era we find ourselves in the peaceful possession of the fairest portion of the earth as regards extent of territory fertility of soil and salubrity of climate we find ourselves under the government of a system of political institutions conducing more essentially to the ends of civil and religious liberty than any which the history of former times tells us we when mounting the stage of existence found ourselves the legal inheritors of these fundamental blessings we toiled not in the acquisition or establishment of them they are a legacy bequeathed us by a once hardy brave and patriotic but now lamented and departed race of ancestors theirs was the task and nobly they performed it to possess themselves and through themselves us of this goodly land and to uprear upon its hills and valleys a political edifice of liberty and equal rights tis ours only to transmit these the former unprofaned by the foot of an invader the latter undecayed by the lapse of time and untorn by usurpation to the latest generation that fate shall permit the world to know this task gratitude to our fathers justice to ourselves duty to posterity all imperatively require us faithfully to perform how then shall we perform it at what point shall we expect the approach of danger shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow never all the armies of europe asia and africa combined with all the treasure of the earth our own excepted in their military chest with a bonaparte for a commander could not by force take a drink from the ohio or make a track on the blue ridge in a trial of a thousand years at what point then is the approach of danger to be expected i answer if it ever reach us it must spring up amongst us it cannot come from abroad if destruction be our lot we must ourselves be its author and finisher as a nation of free men we must live through all time or die by suicide i hope i am not over wary but if i am not there is even now something of ill omen amongst us i mean the increasing disregard for law which pervades the country and growing disposition to substitute the wild and furious passions in lieu of the sober judgment of courts and the worse than savage mobs for the executive ministers of justice this disposition is awfully fearful in any community and that it now exists in ours though grating to our feelings to admit it it would be a violation of truth and an insult to our intelligence to deny accounts of outrages committed by mobs form the everyday news of our times they have pervaded the country from new england to louisiana they are neither peculiar to the eternal snows of the former nor the burning sun of the latter they are not the creature of climate neither are they confined to the slaveholding or the non-slaveholding states alike they spring up among the pleasure-hunting masters of southern slaves and the order-loving citizens of the land of steady habits whatever then their cause may be it is common to the whole country the orator then adverts to the doings of recent mobs in various parts of the country and insists that if the spirit that produced them continues to increase the laws and the government itself must fall before it bad citizens will be encouraged and good ones having no protection against the lawless will be glad to receive an individual master who will be able to give them the peace and order they desire that will be the time when the usurper will put down his heel on the neck of the people and batter down the fair fabric of free institutions many great and good men he says sufficiently qualified for any task they should undertake may ever be found whose ambition would aspire to nothing beyond a seat in congress a gubernatorial or a presidential chair but such belong not to the family of the lion or the tribe of the eagle what think you these places would satisfy an alexander a caesar or a napoleon never towering genius disdains the beaten path 
it seeks regions hitherto unexplored it sees no distinction in adding story to story upon the monuments of fame erected to the memory of others it denies that it is glory enough to serve under any chief it scorns to tread in the footsteps of any predecessor however illustrious it thirsts and burns for distinction and if possible it will have it whether at the expense of emancipating slaves or of enslaving freemen another reason which once was but which to the same extent is now no more has done much in maintaining our institutions thus far i mean the powerful influence which the interesting scenes of the revolution had upon the passions of the people as distinguished from their judgment this influence the lecturer maintains was kept alive by the presence of the surviving soldiers of the revolution who were in some sort living histories and he concludes with this striking peroration but those histories are gone they can be read no more for ever they were a fortress of strength but what invading foemen could never do the silent artillery of time has done the levelling of its walls they are gone they were a forest of giant oaks but the all-resistless hurricane has swept over them and left only here and there a lonely trunk despoiled of its verdure shorn of its foliage unshading and unshaded to murmur in a few more gentle breezes and to combat with its mutilated limbs a few more rude storms then to sink and be no more they were the pillars of the temple of liberty and now that they have crumbled away that temple must fall unless we the descendants supply their places with other pillars hewn from the same solid quarry of sober reason passion has helped us but can do so no more it will in future be our enemy reason cold calculating unimpassioned reason must furnish all the materials for our future support and defence let those materials be moulded into general intelligence sound morality and in particular a reverence for the constitution and the laws and that we improved to the last that we revered his name to the last that during his long sleep we permitted no hostile foot to pass or desecrate his resting-place shall be that which to learn the last trump shall awaken our washington upon these let the proud fabric of freedom rest as the rock of its basis and as truly as has been said of the only greater institution the gates of hell shall not prevail against it these extracts from a lecture carefully composed by mr lincoln at the mature age of twenty-eight and after considerable experience in the public service are worthy of attentive perusal to those familiar with his sober and pure style at a later age these sophomoric passages will seem incredible but they were thought able and eloquent by the young men's lyceum of springfield he was solicited to furnish a copy for publication and they were duly printed in the sangamon journal in the mere matter of rhetoric they compare favorably with some of his other productions of nearly the same date this was what he would have called his growing time and it is intensely interesting to witness the processes of such mental growth as his in time gradually but still rapidly his style changes completely the constrained and unnatural attempts at striking and lofty metaphor disappear and the qualities which produced the gettysburg address that model of unadorned eloquence begin to be felt he finds the people understand him better when he comes down from his stilts and talks to them from their own level political discussions at springfield were apt to run into heated and sometimes unseemly personal controversies when douglas and stuart were candidates for congress in eighteen thirty eight they fought like tigers in herndon's grocery over a floor that was drenched with slops and gave up the struggle only when both were exhausted then as a further entertainment to the populace mr stuart ordered out a barrel of whiskey and wine on election day in eighteen forty it was reported to mr lincoln that one radford a contractor on the railroad had brought up his men and taken full possession of one of the polling places lincoln started off to the precinct on a slow trot 
Radford knew him well, and a little stern advice reversed proceedings without any fighting. Among other remarks, Lincoln said, Radford, you'll spoil and blow if you live much longer. He wanted to hit Radford, but could get no chance to do so, and contented himself with confiding his intentions to speed. I intended just to knock him down and leave him kicking. The same year, Colonel Baker was making a speech to a promiscuous audience in the courtroom, a rented room in Hoffman's Row. It will be remembered that Lincoln's office was just above, and he was listening to Baker through a large hole or trap-door in the ceiling. Baker warmed with his theme, and, growing violent and personally offensive, declared at length that wherever there was a land office there was a democratic newspaper to defend its corruptions. This, says John B. Weber, was a personal attack on my brother George Weber. I was in the courthouse, and in my anger cried, Pull him down! A scene of great confusion ensued, threatening to end in a general riot, in which Baker was likely to suffer. But just at the critical moment Lincoln's legs were seen coming through the hole, and directly his tall figure was standing between Baker and the audience, gesticulating for silence. "'Gentlemen,' said he, "'let us not disgrace the age and country in which we live. This is a land where freedom of speech is guaranteed. Mr. Baker has a right to speak, and ought to be permitted to do so. I am here to protect him, and no man shall take him from this stand if I can prevent it.' Weber only recollects that someone made some soothing kind remarks, and that he was properly held until the excitement ceased, and the affair soon ended in quiet and peace. In 1838 or 1840, Jesse B. Thomas made an intemperate attack upon the Long Nine, and especially upon Mr. Lincoln as the longest and worst of them. Lincoln was not present at the meeting, but being sent for, and informed of what had passed, he ascended the platform, and made a reply which nobody seems to remember, but which every one describes as a terrible skinning of his victim. Ellis says that at the close of a furious personal denunciation he wound up by mimicking Thomas, until Thomas actually cried with vexation and anger. Edwards, Speed, Ellis, Davis, and many others refer to this scene, and being asked whether Mr. Lincoln could not be vindictive upon occasion, generally respond, Remember the Thomas skinning. The most intimate friend Mr. Lincoln ever had, at this or any other time, was probably Joshua F. Speed. In 1836 he settled himself in Springfield, and did a thriving business as a merchant. Ellis was one of his clerks, and so also was William H. Herndon, Mr. Lincoln's future partner. This store was for years Lincoln's familiar haunt. There he came to while away the tedious evenings with speed, and the congenial company that naturally assembled around these choice spirits. He even slept in the storeroom as often as he slept at home, and here made to speed the most confidential communications he ever made to mortal man. If he had on earth a bosom crony, it was speed, and that deep and abiding attachment subsisted unimpaired to the day of Mr. Lincoln's death. In truth, there were good reasons why he should think of speed with affection and gratitude, for through life no man rendered him more important services. One night, in December 1839, Lincoln, Douglas, Baker, and some other gentlemen of note were seated at Speed's hospitable fire in the store. They got to talking politics, got warm, hot, angry. Douglas sprang up and said, "'Gentlemen, this is no place to talk politics. We will discuss the questions publicly with you,' and much more in a high tone of banter and defiance. A few days afterwards the Whigs had a meeting, at which Mr. Lincoln reported a resolution challenging the Democrats to a joint debate. The challenge was accepted, and Douglas, Calhoun, Lamborn, and Jesse B. Thomas were deputed by the Democrats to meet Logan, Baker, Browning, and Lincoln on the part of the Whigs. The intellectual encounter between these noted champions is still described by those who witnessed it as the great debate. It took place in the Second Presbyterian Church, in the hearing of as many people as could get into the building, and was adjourned from night to night. When Mr. Lincoln's turn came, the audience was very thin, and 
but for all that his speech was by many persons considered the best one in the series. To this day there are some who believe he had assistance in the preparation of it. Even Mr. Herndon accused Speed of having had a hand in it, and got a flat denial for his answer. At all events the speech was a popular success, and was written out and published in the Sangamon Journal of March 6, 1840. The exordium was a sort of complaint that must have had a very depressing effect upon both the speaker and his hearers. Fellow citizens, it is peculiarly embarrassing to me to attempt a continuance of the discussion on this evening, which has been conducted in this hall on several preceding ones. It is so because on each of these evenings there was a much fuller attendance than now, without any reason for its being so, except the greater interest the community feel in the speakers who addressed them then, than they do in him who is to do so now. I am indeed apprehensive that the few who have attended have done so more to spare me of mortification than in the hope of being interested in anything I may be able to say. This circumstance casts a damp upon my spirits, which I am sure I shall be unable to overcome during the evening." The subject heretofore and now to be discussed is the sub-treasury scheme of the present administration, as a means of collecting, safekeeping, transferring, and dispersing the revenues of the nation, as contrasted with a national bank for the same purposes. Mr. Douglas has said that we, the Whigs, have not dared to meet them, the Locos, in argument on this question. I protest against this assertion. I say we have, again and again during this discussion, urged facts and arguments against the sub-treasury, which they have neither dared to deny nor attempted to answer. But lest some may be led to believe that we really wish to avoid the question, I now propose, in my humble way, to urge these arguments again, at the same time begging the audience to mark well the positions I shall take, and the proofs I shall offer to sustain them and that they will not again allow Mr. Douglas or his friends to escape the force of them by a round and groundless assertion that we dare not meet them in argument. Of a sub-treasury, then, as contrasted with a national bank, for the before enumerated purposes, I lay down the following propositions, to wit, first, it will injuriously affect the community by its operation on the circulating medium, second, it will be a more expensive fiscal agent. Third, it will be a less secure depository for the public money. Mr. Lincoln's objections to the sub-treasury were those commonly urged by its enemies, and have been somewhat conclusively refuted by the operation of that admirable institution from the hour of its adoption to the present. The extravagant expenditures of Mr. Van Buren's administration, however, was a standard topic of the Whigs in those days, and sliding gracefully off from the sub-treasury, Mr. Lincoln dilated extensively upon this more attractive subject. This part of his speech was entirely in reply to Mr. Douglas. But when he came to answer Mr. Lamborn's remarks, he got in a hard hit that must have brought down the house. Mr. Lamborn insists that the difference between the Van Buren party and the Whigs is that, although the former sometimes err in practice, they are always correct in principle, whereas the latter are wrong in principle, and, the better to impress this proposition, he uses a figurative expression in these words, the Democrats are vulnerable in the heel, but they are sound in the heart and head. The first branch of the figure, that is, that the Democrats are vulnerable in the heel, I admit is not merely figuratively but literally true. Who that looks but for a moment at their Swartwouts, their Prices, their Harringtons, and their hundreds of others, scampering away with the public money, to Texas, to Europe, and to every spot of the earth where a villain may hope to find refuge from justice, can at all doubt that they are most distressingly affected in their heels, with a species of running itch. It seems that this malady of their heels operates on the sound-headed and honest-hearted creatures very much like the cork leg in the comic song did on its owner, which when he had once got started on it, the more he tried to stop it, the more it would run away. At the hazard of wearing this point threadbare, I will relate an anecdote which seems to be too strikingly on point to be omitted, 
a witty irish soldier who was always boasting of his bravery when no danger was near but who invariably retreated without orders at the first charge of the engagement being asked by his captain why he did so replied captain i have as brave a heart as julius caesar ever had but somehow or other whenever danger approaches my cowardly legs will run away with it so with mr lamborn's party they take the public money into their hands for the most laudable purpose that wise heads and honest hearts can dictate but before they can possibly get it out again their rascally vulnerable heels will run away with them but as in the lecture before the lyceum mr lincoln reserved his most impressive passage his boldest imagery and his most striking metaphor for a grand and vehement peroration mr lamborn refers to the late elections in the states and from their results confidently predicts every state in the union will vote for mr van buren at the next presidential election address that argument to cowards and knaves with the free and the brave it will affect nothing it may be true if it must let it many free countries have lost their liberty and ours may lose hers but if she shall be it my proudest plume not that i was the last to desert but that i never deserted her i know that the great volcano at washington aroused and directed by the evil spirit that reigns there is belching forth the lava of political corruption in a current broad and deep which is sweeping with frightful velocity over the whole length and breadth of the land bidding fair to leave unscathed no green spot or living thing while on its bosom are riding like demons on the wave of hell the imps of that evil spirit and fiendishly taunting all those who dare to resist its destroying course with the hopelessness of their efforts and knowing this i cannot deny that all may be swept away broken by it i too may be bow to it i never will the probability that we may fall in the struggle ought not to deter us from the support of a cause we believe to be just it shall not deter me if ever i feel the soul within me elevate and expand to those dimensions not wholly unworthy of its almighty architect it is when i contemplate the cause of my country deserted by all the world beside and i standing up boldly alone hurling defiance at her victorious oppressors here without contemplating consequences before heaven and in the face of the world i swear eternal fealty to the just cause as i deem it of the land of my life my liberty and my love and who that thinks with me will not fearlessly adopt that oath that i take let none falter who thinks he is right and we may succeed but if after all we shall fail be it so we shall still have the proud consolation of saying to our consciences and to the departed shade of our country's freedom that the cause approved of our judgment and adored of our hearts in disaster in chains in torture in death we never faltered in defending considering that the times were extremely peaceful and that the speaker saw no bloodshed except what flowed from the noses of the belligerents in the groceries about springfield this speech seems to have been unnecessarily defiant in eighteen forty mr lincoln was a candidate for presidential elector on the harrison ticket and stumped a large part of the state he and douglas followed judge treat's court all around the district and spoke in the afternoons the harrison club at springfield became thoroughly familiar with his voice but these one-sided affairs were not altogether suited to his temper through his life he preferred a joint discussion and the abler the man pitted against him the better he liked it he knew he shone in retort and sought every opportunity to practice it from eighteen thirty eight to eighteen fifty eight he seems to have followed up douglas as a regular business during times of great political excitement and only on one or two occasions did he find the little giant averse to a conflict here in eighteen forty they came in collision as they did in eighteen thirty nine and as they continued to do through twenty or more years until lincoln became president of the united states and douglas's disappointments were buried with his body once during this harrison campaign they had a fierce discussion before a meeting assembled in the market-house 
In the course of his speech, Lincoln imputed to Van Buren the great sin of having voted in the New York State Convention for Negro suffrage with a property qualification. Douglas denied the fact, and Lincoln attempted to prove his statement by reading a certain passage from Holland's Life of Van Buren, containing a letter from Van Buren to one Mr. Fithian. Whereupon, Douglas got mad, snatched up the book, and tossing it into the crowd, remarked sententiously, although not conclusively, "'Damn such a book!' Lincoln was very sensitive, says Mr. Gillespie, where he thought he had failed to come up to the expectations of his friends. I remember a case. He was pitted by the Whigs in 1840 to debate with Mr. Douglas, the Democratic champion. Lincoln did not come up to the requirements of the occasion. He was conscious of his failure, and I never saw any man so much distressed. He begged to be permitted to try it again, and was reluctantly indulged, and in the next effort he transcended our highest expectations. I never heard, and never expect to hear, such a triumphant vindication as he then gave of Whig measures or policy. He never after, to my knowledge, fell below himself. It must by this time be clear to the reader that Mr. Lincoln was never agitated by any passion more intense than his wonderful thirst for distinction. There is good evidence that it furnished the feverish dreams of his boyhood, and no man that knew him well can doubt that it governed all his conduct, from the hour when he astonished himself by his oratorical success against Posey and Ewing, in the back settlements of Macon County, to the day when the assassin marked him as the first hero of the restored Union, re-elected to his great office, surrounded by every circumstance that could minister to his pride, or exalt his sensibilities, a ruler whose power was only less wide than his renown. He never rested in the race he had determined to run. He was ever ready to be honored. He struggled incessantly for place. There is no instance where an important office seemed to be within his reach, and he did not try to get it. Whatsoever he did in politics, at the bar, in private life, had more or less reference to this great object of his life. It is not meant to be said that he was capable of any shameful act, any personal dishonor, any surrender or concealment of political convictions. In these respects he was far better than most men. It was not in his nature to run away from the fight, or to desert to the enemy, but he was quite willing to accept his full share of the fruits of victory. Born in the humblest circumstances, uneducated, poor, acquainted with flatboats and groceries, but a stranger to the drawing-room, it was natural that he should seek in a matrimonial alliance those social advantages which he felt were necessary to his political advancement. This was, in fact, his own view of the matter, but it was strengthened and enforced by the counsels of those whom he regarded as friends. In 1839, Miss Mary, daughter of Honorable Robert S. Todd of Lexington, Kentucky, came to live with her sister, Mrs. Ninian W. Edwards, at Springfield. Like Miss Owens, Miss Todd had a stepmother, with whom she failed to agree, and for that reason the Edwardses offered her a home with them. She was young, just twenty-one, her family was of the best, and her connections in Illinois among the most refined and distinguished people. Her mother having died when she was a little girl, she had been educated under the care of a French lady, opposite Mr. Clay's. She was gifted with rare talents, had a keen sense of the ridiculous, a ready insight into the weaknesses of individual character, and a most fiery and ungovernable temper. Her tongue and her pen were equally sharp. High-bred, proud, brilliant, witty, and with a will that bent every one else to her purpose, she took Mr. Lincoln captive the very moment she considered it expedient to do so. Mr. Lincoln was a rising politician, fresh from the people, and possessed of great power among them, Miss Todd was of aristocratic and distinguished family, able to lead through the awful portals of good society, whomsoever they chose to countenance. It was thought that a union between them could not fail of numerous benefits to both parties. Mr. Edwards thought so, Mrs. Edwards thought so, and it was not long before Mary Todd herself thought so, 
She was very ambitious, and even before she left Kentucky announced her belief that she was destined to be the wife of some future president. For a little while she was courted by Douglas as well as by Lincoln, but she is said to have refused the little giant on account of his bad morals. Being asked which of them she intended to have, she answered, the one that has the best chance of being president. She decided in favor of Lincoln, and in the opinion of some of her husband's friends, aided to no small extent in the fulfillment of the prophecy which the bestowal of her hand implied. A friend of Miss Todd was the wife of an elderly but wealthy gentleman, and being asked by one of the Edwards coterie why she had married such an old, dried-up husband, such a withered-up old buck, she answered that he had lots of horses and gold. But Mary Todd spoke up in great surprise, and said, Is that true? I would rather marry a good man, a man of mind, with hope and bright prospects ahead for position, fame, and power, than to marry all the horses, gold, and bones in the world. Mrs. Edwards, Miss Todd's sister, tells us that Mr. Lincoln was charmed with Mary's wit, and fascinated with her quick sagacity, her will, her nature, and her culture. I have happened in the room, she says, where they were sitting, often and often, and Mary led the conversation. Lincoln would listen and gaze on her as if drawn by some superior power, irresistibly so. He listened, but never scarcely said a word. Lincoln could not hold a lengthy conversation with a lady, was not sufficiently educated and intelligent in the female line to do so. Mr. Lincoln and Mary were engaged, and their marriage was only a question of time. But Mr. Lincoln's love affairs were destined never to run smoothly, and now one Miss Matilda Edwards made her sweet appearance and brought havoc in her train. She was the sister of Ninian W. Edwards, and came to spend a year with her brother. She was very fair, and soon was the reigning belle. No sooner did Lincoln know her than he felt his heart change. The other affair, according to the Edwardses, according to Stuart, according to Herndon, according to Lincoln and everybody else, was a policy match. But this was love. For a while he evidently tried hard to go on as before, but his feelings were too strong to be concealed. Mr. Edwards endeavored to reconcile matters by getting his sister to marry Speed, but the rebellious beauty refused Speed incontinently, as she did Douglas too, and married Mr. Schuyler Strong. Poor Lincoln never whispered a word of his passion to her. His high sense of honor prevented that. And perhaps she would not have listened to him if it had been otherwise. At length, after long reflection, in great agony of spirit, Mr. Lincoln concluded that duty required him to make a candid statement of his feelings to the lady who was entitled to his hand. He wrote her a letter, and told her, gently but plainly, that he did not love her. He asked Speed to deliver it, but Speed advised him to burn it. Speed, said Mr. Lincoln, I always knew you were an obstinate man. If you won't deliver it, I'll get someone else to do it. But Speed now had the letter in his hand, and, emboldened by the warm friendship that existed between them, he replied, I shall not deliver it, nor give it back to you to be delivered. Words are forgotten, misunderstood, passed by not noticed in a private conversation, but once put your words in writing and they stand as a living and eternal monument against you. If you think you have will and manhood enough to go and see her and speak to her what you say in this letter, you may do that. Lincoln went to see her forthwith, and reported to Speed. He said that when he made his somewhat startling communication, she rose and said, The deceiver shall be deceived, woe is me, alluding to a young man she had fooled. Mary told him she knew the reason for his change of heart, and released him from his engagement. Some parting endearments took place between them, and then, as the natural result of those endearments, a reconciliation. We quote again from Mrs. Edwards. Lincoln and Mary were engaged. Everything was ready and prepared for the marriage, even to the supper. Mr. Lincoln failed to meet his engagement cause, insanity. In his lunacy he declared he hated Mary and loved Miss Edwards. This is true, yet it was not his real feelings. A crazy man hates those he loves when at himself. 
Often, often is this the case. The world had it that Mr. Lincoln backed out, and this placed Mary in a peculiar situation, and to set herself right and free Mr. Lincoln's mind, she wrote a letter to Mr. Lincoln, stating that she would release him from his engagement. The whole of that year was a crazy spell. Miss Edwards was at our house, say, a year. I asked Miss Edwards if Mr. Lincoln ever mentioned the subject of his love to her. Miss Edwards said, on my word, he never mentioned such a subject to me. He never even stooped to pay me a compliment. In the language of Mr. Edwards, Lincoln went as crazy as a loon, and was taken to Kentucky by Speed, who kept him until he recovered. He did not attend the legislature in 1841-42 for this reason. Mr. Herndon devoutly believes that Mr. Lincoln's insanity grew out of a most extraordinary complication of feelings, aversion to the marriage proposed, a counter-attachment to Miss Edwards, and a new access of unspeakable tenderness for the memory of Anne Rutledge, the old love struggling with a new one, and each sending to his heart a sacrificial pang as he thought of his solemn engagement to marry a third person. In this opinion Mr. Speed appears to concur, as shown by his letter below. At all events Mr. Lincoln's derangement was nearly, if not quite, complete. We had to remove razors from his room, says Speed, take away all knives and other dangerous things. It was terrible. And now Speed determined to do for him what Bowlin Green had done on a similar occasion at New Salem. Having sold out his store on the 1st of January, 1841, he took Mr. Lincoln with him to his home in Kentucky, and kept him there during most of the summer and fall, or until he seemed sufficiently restored to be given his liberty again at Springfield, when he was brought back to his old quarters. During this period he was at times very melancholy, and by his own admission almost contemplated self-destruction. It was about this time that he wrote some gloomy lines under the head of suicide, which were published in the Sangamon Journal. Mr. Herndon remembered something about them, but when he went to look for them in the office file of the journal, he found them neatly cut out. Supposed to have been done, says he, by Lincoln. Speed's mother was much pained by the deep depression of her guest, and gave him a Bible, advising him to read it, to adopt its precepts, and to pray for its promises. He acknowledged this attempted service after he became president, by sending her a photograph of himself with this inscription, To my very good friend, Mrs. Lucy G. Speed, from whose pious hands I received an Oxford Bible twenty years ago. But Mrs. Speed's medicine, the best ever offered for a mind diseased, was of no avail in this case. Among other things he told Speed, referring probably to his inclination to commit suicide, that he had done nothing to make any human being remember that he had ever lived, and that to connect his name with the events transpiring in his day and generation, and so impress himself upon them as to link his name with something that would redound to the interest of his fellow man, was what he desired to live for. Of this conversation he pointedly reminded Speed, at the time, or just before the time, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. What took place after his return to Springfield cannot be better told than in the words of the friends of both parties. Mr. Edwards and myself, says Mrs. Edwards, after the first crash of things, told Mary and Lincoln that they had better not ever marry, that their natures, minds, education, raising, etc., were so different that they could not live happy as man and wife, had better never think of the subject again, all at once we heard that Mr. Lincoln and Mary had secret meetings at Mr. S. Francis's, editor of the Springfield Journal. Mary said the reason this was so, the cause why it was, was that the world, woman and man, were uncertain and slippery, and that it was best to keep the secret courtship from all eyes and ears. Mrs. Lincoln told Mr. Lincoln that though she had released him in the letter spoken of, yet she would hold the question an open one, that is, she had not changed her mind, but felt as always. The marriage of Mr. Lincoln and Mary was quick and sudden, one or two hours' notice. How poor Mr. Lincoln felt about it may be gathered from the reminiscences of his friend J. H. Matheny, who says that Lincoln and himself, in 1842, were very friendly, 
that Lincoln came to him one evening and said, "'Jim, I shall have to marry that girl.' He was married that evening, but Matheny says he looked as if he was going to the slaughter, and that Lincoln had often told him, directly and individually, that he was driven into the marriage, that it was concocted and planned by the Edwards family, that Miss Todd, afterwards Mrs. Lincoln, was crazy for a week or so, not knowing what to do, and that he loved Miss Edwards, and went to see her and not Mrs. Lincoln. The license to marry was issued on the 4th of November, 1842, and on the same day the marriage was celebrated by Charles Dresser, M.G. With this date borne carefully in mind, the following letters are of surpassing interest. They are relics not only of a great man, but of a great agony. The first is from Mr. Speed to Mr. Herndon, and explains the circumstances under which the correspondence took place. Although it is in part a repetition of what the reader already knows, it is of such peculiar value that we give it here in full. W. H. Herndon, Esquire. Dear Sir, I enclose you copies of all the letters of any interest from Mr. Lincoln to me. Some explanation may be needed that you may rightly understand their import. In the winter of 1840 and 1841 he was unhappy about his engagement to his wife, not being entirely satisfied that his heart was going with his hand. How much he suffered then on that account none knows so well as myself. He disclosed his whole heart to me. In the summer of 1841 I became engaged to my wife. He was here on a visit when I courted her, and, strange to say, something of the same feeling which I regarded as so foolish in him took possession of me and kept me very unhappy from the time of my engagement until I was married. This will explain the deep interest he manifested in his letters on my account. Louisville, November 30th, 1866 If you use the letters, and some of them are perfect gems, do it carefully, so as not to wound the feelings of Mrs. Lincoln. One thing is plainly discernible. If I had not been married and happy, far more happy than I ever expected to be, he would not have married. I have erased a name which I do not wish published. If I have failed to do it anywhere, strike it out when you come to it. That is the word, blank. I thank you for your last lecture. It is all new to me, but so true to my appreciation of Lincoln's character, that independent of my knowledge of you I would almost swear to it. Lincoln wrote a letter, a long one which he read to me, to Dr. Drake of Cincinnati, descriptive of his case. Its date would be in December 1840, or early in January 1841. I think he must have informed Dr. D. of his early love for Miss Rutledge, as there was a part of the letter which he would not read. It would be worth much to you if you could procure the original. Charles D. Drake of St. Louis may have his father's papers. The date which I give you will aid in the search. I remember Dr. Drake's reply, which was that he would not undertake to prescribe for him without a personal interview. I would advise you to make some effort to get that letter. Your friend, etc., J. F. Speed. End of section 14